Okay, thank you, Fabrice, and thank you, the organizers, for the invitation to participate in the program and the, in the workshop. So the, the, the talk will be mainly some review of uh, known results on the self-similar solutions of um, geometric flow. But uh, this uh, uh, review is motivated by some recent numerical simulations we have done about the flow. And uh, we have obtained some kind of uh, what I think are nice pictures. And I will put uh, the, the pictures at the end of the talk, OK? So the flow is uh, the following. <coughs> Here x is a vector in R3. And S, as you will see in a limit in a minute, is arc length. T is time. And this can be either in the continuous case or the periodic case. So for a fixed uh, T, what I have is um, the map from S to capital X of ST gives me a curve in R3. So what I am giving is a law of motion of these curves. And uh, I should better start saying what is the geometrical meaning. So in order to do that, I have to define the, the tangent vector X, tangent vector T, which is the derivative with respect to S of capital X. So then if I differentiate here, then when the derivative falls with respect to S, when the derivative falls here, I get 0. And then the only term that is remaining is this one, which is um, called the Schrodinger map. <coughs> In this case, I'm to the case we are interested is in onto the sphere in uh, in R three because of course if I compute this which is the same as the derivative of the length the square of the tangent vector this immediately is zero so if I start assuming that t has um, unit length then and you have a good solution, <coughs> regular, whatever, then the, the uh, arc length parametrization will be preserved along the flow. So then T can be visualized as a map from, say, whatever, R or the, or the torus into the unit sphere, and then, of course, because t is the tangent vector to the unit sphere, and we have this cross product, then this cross product has two, two implications. One is that you are projecting the second derivative with respect to the tangent plane, and the second one is that you are rotation. You are making a rotation of pi over 2 in this, in this tangent plane. So of course, you can rewrite this as um, Right, <coughs> where ds, capital ds, means the covariant of the derivative, and j is just rotation in the, in the <coughs> tangent plane to, to the given point on the sphere. So this is the reason why this is called the Schrodinger map. Uh, so this is a first connection with, uh, say, dispersive PDs. At the geometric level, then now from that equation is... Uh, if I use, let me put it here, if I use the Frenet frame, <coughs> which is Ts equals the curvature times the normal, I guess that some, sometimes people like to call the curvature uh, kappa, but uh, I guess this is for plane curves. One of the papers we wrote, we have to change everything because the referee decided that the curvature has to be called kappa. But then <coughs> So this is the torsion, and then Bs equals minus the torsion 
times n, right? So the derivative of the tangent is the curvature times the normal. So then I go to uh, this equation that uh, I guess I call it vortex filament equation, but uh, I prefer to call it the binormal flow. And now the reason is this, that of course uh, this is t cross product uh, the, the derivative of the of uh, of the derivative of x which is ts so this is nothing but the curvature times the binormal okay so the flow is telling me that uh, uh, if i have a, a point of the in the curve then this point is moving in the direction of the binormal with a velocity or a speed that it is given by the curvature and as we will see in a minute, there, will, there is no ambiguity by uh, assuming that the curvature is zero, because that would mean that the velocity is zero in that case. So <coughs> this is, uh, as many people in the audience know, this is a model, an old model, that uh, was obtained a long time ago by the Rios as, say, uh, an approximation of the evolution of uh, vortex filaments <coughs> where vortex filaments uh, I guess uh, there is no uh, if you are in Euler equation quite likely you, you have a, a, a precise definition but if you want to see real fluids this definition is not clear but uh, because <coughs> you will have to assume so always some kind of viscosity and then it will never be a filament uh, it can be you can start with something which is a filament but uh, any time afterwards will never be a filament. But anyway, uh, Didier yesterday showed uh, the video where <coughs> what is a vortex ring, you remember? That uh, you have the cardboard and you have a hole and you use it as a, a smoke cannon and then you remember that uh, you have these vortex rings. Of course, what uh, you, you saw in that experiment is that it is not really a filament, it is a tube. But uh, you can try to uh, visualize, uh, say, the vorticity in a better way by using bubbles instead of uh, smoke. And there are pictures where really when you look at the bubbles, they, they look very much as, as a filament, even for water, OK? Anyway, so this is, uh, um, so in a sense, uh, the, the story goes more or less as follows. You have the velocity, you have the vorticity, which is the curl of the velocity. And you are saying that this vorticity is a, a vector, but what it is a, a supported is a singular measure which is supported in the filament. Okay, then you want to construct, you want to compute the velocity at the through the Biot Savart law at the precisely at the filament, and you, this is a singular integral, and there is no reasonable way of doing it. And at some point you even has uh, some log of epsilon where the log of epsilon was precisely the same that Didier had yesterday, and then you kill it. You say I renormalize time, and I obtain a relevant term, the first term of the Taylor expansion, and this is the, the curvature times the binormal. So the reason I'm saying all this is because uh, it's very, very, very unclear that uh, this model at the end of the day is related to, to real fluids. Definitely will never be related at the quantitative level. Right. Among other things, uh, this is a local model, while Biot Savart is a singular integral, so it should never be a local model. And there is the possibility that at the qualitative level, <coughs> maybe uh, you can learn something about real fluids by studying this particular model. In any case, I, I, I think that the, the, from the mathematical point of view, the system of PDEs that uh, this geometric flow implies, I think it is interesting and uh, uh, I hope I will uh, support my, <coughs> my sta statement with the pictures at the end of the, of the talk. Okay, so why do I think that maybe at the qualitative level is, is uh, uh, maybe you are saying something reasonable is because there are some particular solutions, of course, which are straight lines. of the uh, binormal flow that are definitely uh, guys that you recognize in real fluids. 
that should be the, the tap, uh, the vortex tap or tap vortex, uh, vortex, I mean the usual that you see in the bathroom. The other one, of course, are the vortex rings. And there is also uh, the helical uh, or helices that uh, are both solutions in in the in the model and the Euler. At least for an helix, you can have uh, helix configurations that probably they are not really pure helices, but uh, at least the shape is very much that one. All right, so. <coughs> What was, uh, as I said, the motivation was these numerical experiments and uh, the, the reason of doing something numerical and not just um, uh, proving theorems is, of course, you, at least in my case, I try to do the numerics when I am not able to prove theorems. And the reason why I cannot prove theorems here is because um, recently with De La Oth, we look at the case where, the, say, the starting uh, a curve is a regular polygon. Say, like a equilateral triangle or a square. And of course, if you, uh, uh, when we submitted the paper, we received, uh, like what, two months later, a, a very furious uh, referee saying that we didn't know what we were talking about that this has nothing to do with anything, uh, that definitely nothing, nothing to do with uh, uh, fluids, because the equation doesn't make any sense with this kind of uh, singularity, right? Well, it is very unclear that you can, or it is not clear at all what is the definition of the curvature times the binormal in a, in a corner, right? So this is one of the difficulties, but uh, from the PDE point of view, this is the relevant thing, I mean, in the sense that uh, uh, if I want to understand the uh, singular dynamics, this is the guy because it has the, the right uh, uh, scaling. All right, so then it turned out <coughs> you could ask, um, can I make any experiment like the one that uh, um, Didier showed you yesterday? And of course, you can be very naive and say, well, if in order to create um, a smoke, uh, a smoke ring, the only thing you have to do is to put <coughs> a circle. Then you can say, well, what happens if I put uh, a equilateral triangle, right? <coughs> or a square. And of course, this uh, has done for many people. You can go to, to, I mean, to Google and you will find many videos of that. And if you do it, <coughs> I also did with my daughter, by the way, <laughs> is, uh, well, you don't see anything at all. I mean, uh, if you have your box here and you should remember that the vortex ring was uh, a very coherent, coherent structure that uh, lasted for quite some time. So if you do that with uh, a shape like this, right? You put the smoke inside and you just push. <coughs> then eventually what you will see is a, a smoke ring, OK? But uh, if what uh, we were saying uh, could happen, should have any possibility of happening, it was clear that you, uh, you were not be able to, to see it with your eye, right? So then you go to the video, and instead of looking, the, say, far away, you look close to the, to the hole. And then you see uh, different things is are happening. OK, in particular, something which is called the axis switching phenomenon. is clear clearly seen. So for example, if I start with this uh, structure, then at some point I see something like this. Of course, corners are not corners any longer, because viscosity will kill everything. <coughs> and in the case of the of the square, you will see something like this, and this appearing and disappearing. In the sense that, for example, if you go to the video and you just see one frame, in one frame probably is in this uh, position, in the next one is in the opposite. Okay. So then you go to 
uh, to Google and you discover that this is called axis switching and the, the keywords are non-circular jets. And this is my definition of non-circular jets, for example. Okay? But uh, then you will go to the references and this was studied uh, with quite a big detail in the late 80s and all through the 90s. And it was mainly done uh, for, I guess, experimentalists, okay? And there is plenty of uh, uh, data from experiments and also from, from real experiments and numerical experiments. So the other phenomenon is that you have multiples of your symmetry, of the starting symmetry, appears. So, in any case, the dynamic seems to be much more complex than the one of the, of the circle up here. So that means that, for example, if I start with a, a triangle like this, at some point I will see an hexagon. And of course, corners are no corners, so you cannot go much farther because the next thing should be something with uh, nine sides and then nine sides with uh, corners which are not corners, then it's uh, very hard to see. But for example, and, um, so there are probably, this is a Gunn's reference, 95, 96, they, you, you will find a picture like this. starting with a square. And they really see, uh, like uh, you start with a four symmetry, you, you, they claim, they, they see, say, coherent structures, whatever this means, with eight sides, all right? And, <coughs> well, if you use this model and you run the, um, the numerics, and uh, in fact, if you do some uh, some analysis, you explain these two things by the Talbot effect, which is a, a phenomenon uh, well known in optics, so it's a, a wave phenomenon. And in fact, we claim this is a really nonlinear Talbot effect, meaning that it is not something that you can obtain by, by looking at the Talbot effect of, uh, of linear optics, say, eh? and then to, from that one to, to deduce something for this equation. Anyway, so we kept, uh, we kept doing uh, some numerics and then we discovered that uh, at time, so if, if this is at time zero, then we discover that time zero plus, if I look at the evolution of this corner of this one, you don't see the influence of the other ones. So the dynamics close to the corner and for infinitesimal times is dictated by the case where you only have one corner, all right? Then what is the case where you only have one corner? Well, this is something that uh, leaves. So I would like to obtain something of this type to look at uh, a, conf a configuration like this one, where a plus and a minus are two unit vectors. So you are dealing with something like this. This is a minus and this is a plus. And of course, this is something that lives in the, uh, in the full, in full space, in the real line. And it has a very precise scaling invariant. So immediately what I am saying is that um, what the numeric suggests, and you can quantify it in a very precise way because there is a very clear uh, geometric thing that it is happening in the evolution of one corner. Some, cor some angle appears and you measure the angle and the angle is the same. That's what we are meaning. So what I say is that at time, at time zero, this corner is, uh, is like if I just look at this. So you can really see the regular polygon as, as that you don't have just one uh, filament, that you have infinitely many. One for each corner. But of course, we're here you have to understand the, the, the close uh, curve as a periodic one and you have infinitely many corners. So, <coughs> all right, so then we decided to, to uh, look more carefully about uh, what we could say 
about cell similar solutions and in particular I will review something which is uh, say kind of old it will appear at the end of 2015 which is one is the uh, continuation so this is one of the things I want to address continuation after the singularity has been developed And here the singularity means corner. Huh? This is my first uh, question. The second question is about conservation laws. And as uh, Monica said this morning, there was this program in, in Berkeley last fall where uh, weak turbulence is in, at least it's on fashion. And, uh, it is very, at least not clear to me at all what is the meaning of uh, weak turbulence, but for example, talking to different people more from the stochastic point of view, uh, you always try to look for some conservation law that it is not preserved because you don't have uh, good boundary conditions. Okay? In this case, uh, the one I guess is sometimes is called the impulse or the linear momentum. And this is one of the conservation laws that this model keeps coming from, say, Euler and Navier stocks. In fact, it's the one very much related to the vortex rig. It's the momentum that the, bo the, the vortex transports, so that if you can use your smoke cannon to, to turn the candle off. You see? That's the kind of thing. And the third issue is, can I say something about well, let me put it in a function of transfer of energy. This is, of course, a very a strong word. Let me just probably to prove something like uh, there is lack of continuity of some norm. OK, so these are the, the three issues. I want to, to look at. So let me start from the last from the last one because <coughs> it is not clear at all what is the good function space for uh, the kind of singular situation I want to study. All right. So maybe we should keep this one. So let's uh, start from the beginning by saying that to use the finite frame is probably not a very good idea because you are using polar coordinates and then you are creating some singularity where, uh, where it is not. So it's much better to, to, to use the so-called parallel frame and then uh, so you have a a system of uh, orthonormal vectors, capital T, of course, which is the tangent, and then E1 and E2, which are a basis in the normal plane. So that now the safe net equations become these other equations. And now, say the scalars, which uh, you need two, that, keeps the, that keep the, the <coughs> geometric information, are given by a complex number, which is alpha plus e beta, <coughs> alpha and beta real, e, e, e1 and e2 and capital T are real vectors. And then it's, I guess uh, it's very well known that uh, this equation has some kind of complex uh, hof cold transformation, which in this setting is called the mm -hmm. uh, Hashimoto transformation, which says that if uh, xi is chosen in this way and capital T evolves according to the Schrodinger map, then you obtain the equation for the, um, you obtain the 1D cubic NLS, and it is focusing because uh, my target is uh, the sphere, and that's the one I'm interested in. So this is one half of um, psi squared minus uh, A of t psi, where A of t 
is real and it is due to the gauge invariance of uh, the problem, right? I always have the freedom to use the coordinates at a given point um, for any t. All right, so then this is, uh, of course, it's a completely integrable system that it have infinitely many conservation laws. And the starting one is L2, at least from the positive one. So if I start with something in L2, This is preserved, but unfortunately, if um, I want to consider this uh, kind of situation, the, the, the curvature in this case is the delta function, so what I am interested in is in something like C0 times the delta, which of course is not in L2, so then you start the, the, the question, at least the, the, the natural question of uh, can you go below L2 naturally appears, and this is something, uh, so you want, say, well postness, say, for any space below L2. And this is something I, I, I think that the first result in this direction was the one I, I proved with Ana Vargas some time ago. And it is the function space is much better understood in terms of the Fourier transform of the initial condition. And you really want it to be a translation invariant because you want the, the, the Galilean invariance to be uh, preserved. So you want a Fourier space, something defined in Fourier space, which is translation invariant. You could also, but then you miss, you, you couldn't, can do something, but uh, then you, you, you remain quite uh, far. I guess that you, if I'm not wrong, we got like one quarter at least, not, not bigger than one quarter gain. So you can keep working in this, say, so by assuming things like this belongs to some probably weighted spaces, and then Grunrock extended all the way up to, say, with some weights, p is smaller than plus infinity, and the real good one, and this is my first Fourier space, would be that I would like to consider data such that the Fourier transform is in L infinity. This is for the, say, the curvature and the torsion. And if you ask yourself in geometric terms what is um, the analogous of this, would be to say that the, the derivative of the tangent, which means curvature times the normal, to be, so remember, this is the same as curvature times the normal, or if you prefer, if you use the other notation, will be this guy in an infinity where n is n1 plus n e2. So this is for, for me today the natural space. Okay, I'm not going to enter if uh, you think this is reasonable or not, but uh, this is it. Okay. <coughs> so what? So this is about function spaces. So the next thing I have to <coughs> to uh, um, recall was about cell similar solutions. So let's do a, some elemental ODE uh, exercises and try to understand the cell similar solutions. And of course, I could try to do it here, but uh, it is not, uh, you can do it, but uh, it's much better to, to work directly in the binormal flow and then uh, they write. Um, ANSATS is something like this, and you are looking for the capital G, <coughs> and T here is positive. Look at this. This equation as Euler it has more than one possible scaling, but if you really want to preserve the, the arc length that, in fact, you want, uh, this is the only possible one. <coughs> and of course, it's the one that also comes when you you start saying Navier Stokes and you pass to the limit in the viscosity. So now I want to find a solution of uh, that uh, binormal flow problem under this setting. So you do the usual things and you end up with this ODE. <coughs> and uh, if you differentiate again, you will obtain, and I keep calling capital T, the corresponding derivative, then immediately you obtain 
minus s over 2 t prime equals <coughs> t cross product t second prime and then you use in this case the net frame and you immediately see that then the curvature has to be a constant and the torsion has to be s over 2. Okay, so this is very easy. <coughs> and then you have a nice uh, real analytic curve in in uh, in 3D and of course uh, the starting question is uh, you expect that the limit when t go to 0 plus of uh, this guy is uh, this guy. This is the question. That means that you really have to understand, uh, say, for S, good. For S uh, strictly positive, you have to understand the, the, the asymptotics of G at infinity. And for example, if the asymptotics of, uh, of this curve at infinity is given by a straight line, this is very easy. Because if you just do this derivative, <coughs> this gives me G prime S minus um, minus g over s square, but remember that this is the curvature times the binormal, the curvature is constant, so precisely this is minus 2 times the curvature times v divided by s square, and if you are in the uh, elliptic case, meaning uh, the sphere, then the binormal has Euclidean distance 1. If you're in the um, hyperbolic plane, you have to work a little bit more, but not that much. So that means that the derivative is integrable, so that, of course, e of s of rs has a limit when s goes to plus minus infinity. Although, of course, you don't know if these two vectors are the same or not. So in order to have a corner, you need to prove that these two vectors are, are not the same. OK, so in fact, you can do much more. And this is something I did a long, long time ago with Gutierrez and Rivas. <coughs> is that, uh, in fact, I always get confused about the angles, but so. Uh, so this is a minus, this is a plus, and I think it is this the angle I have to consider. You can even obtain a very close formula. You say that cosine of theta over 2 is e to the minus pi c squared over 2. So in fact, this gives you uniqueness, a sixth existence for all angle, an, uh, angles, if, except when the two vectors are one the opposite the, uh, of the other one, and also gives you uniqueness. In fact, uh, you can work a little bit more and uh, with tricks similar to that one and you can say that t of s is precisely a plus minus plus 2 times c naught over s times the binormal plus o of 1 over s for say s bigger than 1 and uh, that the binormal is e to the i s squared over 4 plus some logarithmic correction that is, of course, is completely reminiscent that in, de in here you are dealing with uh, some kind of a scattering. This is a scattering problem because I give, I give you the information at zero and, I, and, and I ask something about what happens at infinity. So this log correction is uh, because we all know that uh, the scattering for this equation is long range. So for some b plus minus some o of 1 over s, where this b plus minus is tangent to the a plus minus, and of course this is some uh, real part plus i imaginary part, and they are orthogonal of unitary uh, length. Okay, so the picture is more or less as follows. It's, um, it's very easy to more or less see well, how is the picture of capital G because you know that close to zero the torsion is zero, so it has to be close to, a, say, a horseshoe. And then at infinity it has to be two lines. In between you have a cane, you can kind of freeze and frozen the, the, 
the S, and then it will be an helix with a pitch that uh, will be changing with S. So essentially, this is what you have to. So this will be the A plus, and this will be the A minus. And then, of course, <coughs> what um, the information at the origin is given by the curvature, and this is the information at infinity. All right, so <coughs> this is it. So this is well known. Now, uh, let me try to understand now these three questions about uh, this guy. And the first one, yes? So you have uniqueness here? Yes. So you can prove it. Yes, because of this formula. And why this formula is true is, well, I guess it depends. Uh, as, as you probably know, to, to, to be able to, to, to give a closed formula for this kind of problems is extremely unusual. So you need to have plenty, plenty of symmetry to have such a thing. And of course, uh, this, is, uh, this is not any self-similar solution. You can have more other self-similar solutions, for example, the ones that comes from the <coughs> principal value of 1 over s that are logarithmic spirals. And those ones, I cannot give you a formula like this. The reason is that this one is Galilean invariant. And it is the only one. So I have many more symmetries. Anyway, <coughs> so concerning the, the first question, this is uh, a theorem. It was several works uh, with uh, Valeria Vanica, but at the end of the day, we were able to prove. Ah, OK, so before I do this, in order to conserve to, con to to answer the first question, I have to to really give you uh, uh, to try to 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 extend the solution uh, for say negative time, right? And I will do it as uh, everybody has done it here in the previous talks related to this, right? I I uh, just plug the corresponding conservation law that goes for negative time. So you have always this symmetry that uh, all these are oriented curves. So if I change the orientation, I change time. <coughs> so in order to change orientation, the only thing I have to do is to change this guy into this guy and vice versa with a proper sign. So I could construct in, say, this kind of an artificial way the following guy, which is my starting solution, which is uh, a square root of t g s over a square root of t, say for t positive. And then a square root of absolute value of t, some rotation of g of s over a square root of absolute value of t for t negative. And the only thing I need is to change the orientation. So I need a rotation that, that I think has to do this, or something close to this. And because uh, the, the problem lives in variant rotations, uh, then I will have a solution for t positive, a solution for t negative, and that they have the same initial condition. So I could wonder if this is a solution or not. Okay. So then the theorem with Valeria is that um, yeah, that x tilde is a stable solution in an appropriate sense. And uh, that means that if I make a small perturbations, I, uh, I remain close to the, to the curve. And in particular, the corner is the same. And here, small, uh, the perturbations are done at the level of the curvature and the torsion. They are small in, in some space that uh, is uh, related to that kind of setting. That means that, um, so, uh, that means that I can, uh, if you want, creation and relation of Corners is stable. And this is very important for the case of the regular polygon because uh, corners appear and disappear in a, in a precise way. All right, so uh, the two, th two words about this, and this, was, this is, as I said, uh, appear, the last paper appeared at the end of the last year. <coughs> the first thing is that if I do it at the level of NLS, then it is uh, no way. And this is because if I make, say, I start at, um, so 
let me see, what is the, uh, I should have said this, under this uh, situation, the corresponding psi, of course, is the one you expect. Okay, so imagine that at time one, I start with a small perturbation of C0. Then we are able to construct a solution all the way to uh, zero plus, but when it goes to uh, zero plus, what I obtain, so if you want the asymptotics, is like the C, so it's one over square root of T e to the ix square over four s, uh, sorry, s square over T, plus then you have the problem of the long range appearing, epsilon plus, plus little o of 1. So it doesn't matter what you do, this problem is imposed. In the sense, I, and this is quite generic. I mean, uh, for, all, for say, almost all the, it doesn't matter how small it is. I, I can, I make a perturbation, I construct the solution, I go to the delta function in here, but this one does not have a limit because of this guy. Of course, this from the geometric point of view has no real implication because you always have the freedom of the gauge, so you really want to know if this is a real problem or not. And it turns out that this theorem is telling you that uh, it, it, the, there is kind of a unique, the meaning of what of that has to be precise, to, to, to be precisely written, there is kind of a unique way of continuing the problem when you go back to the geometric setting. All right? And the second, uh, was that in order to do this, this information, so what you are able to prove is that your solution goes to some guy T0 of this, and at the limit you recover the important information, which are the A plus minus B plus minus that comes from the from the cell similar solution, and this is the one that allows you to construct the frame at time zero and to continue. And because you have a, a, a characterization of the cell similar solution, then you can do it. So this is uh, what I wanted to remember. And if this fits pretty well, for example, you will, you will see in a minute with the kind of pictures that Manuel Del Pino was showing yesterday for the heat is reading the map. You will see in a minute this why. So this is about um, the first question. The second question, I will use this blackboard, is that in fact, It's very easy to see that the linear impulse is not preserved. Because the linear impulse is just in this setting is nothing but this. But this is g of um, the square root of t, g of s over the square root of t, cross t of s over the square root of t, and you're integrating in s. So this gives me t g s cross t, but remember that g satisfies that equation, so the only thing I have to do is the uh, and uh, g prime is t, so the only thing that remains is the the normal, so this is uh, nothing but um, the normal cross product with the tangent, so this is t curvature times the normal, which is the derivative of the of the tangent, and then what you are saying is that the tangent at plus minus infinity has this value, so this is precisely t a plus minus a minus for t positive, and for t negative will be the same but with absolute value. So the, the linear impulse, so this is for all. So the linear impulse is not preserved, and it's of course because the, the energy or whatever is going to plus minus infinity, all right? And the third, uh, answering the third question, it turns out that there is some small surprise, at least for me, which is as follows. If I compute the L infinity norm of Ts, which is the same as the curvature times the normal, this is <coughs> four times 
1 minus e to the minus pi c naught square. This is for t equals 0. And for t different from 0 is 4 times pi c naught square. And it turns out that this number is strictly bigger than this one as soon as c naught is not 0. Okay, So there is a lack of continuity in this uh, particular number. <coughs> which if I had to make the picture of what's going on, is exactly the same picture that you, you made yesterday. You have a jump at zero, and then you recover. All right? <coughs> of course, you are able to do this because you have this nice formula. And uh, I this is not so straightforward because, for example, if I go to these asymptotics, I have to pay attention to the next term because I'm computing the, the Fourier transition. So this was uh, some elemental facts. So now it's a very natural question. Can I, what can I say when I start with a regular polygon? Right? And these are the pictures. So I need to. So wha what do I do to turn this? So where is the linear momentum? Remember, it's um, here. So what I'm going to show you is what can I say, for example, with a linear momentum, in the case of a regular polygon where you have many more symmetries. And um, well, if you start to think a little bit about what I have just written, okay, that um, this, then you don't see this problem in the periodic case, of course. Okay, so the linear momentum has three components. This would be the third one. My, uh, my, in this case, I think it's a equilateral triangle. I don't know what happens. And this would be the third component. So the third component will be this one. And you see that essentially is conserved. You, you see that uh, all the numbers on the left are the same. All right? And then if you do the other two by symmetry, they are going to be zero. OK? Right? Just by symmetry of the problem. So what is uh, kind of a, uh, you want to see if there is, at least when you look at the density of the, of the conservation law, if there is some transfer from one place to another one. And then you do the, uh, instead of integrating in a closed uh, curve, you integrate in half of it. And I show you the, the, the first and the second component. And this is what you see, which is the the classical picture of, say, for example, the Riemann non-differentiable function, something, say, some intermittency or whatever, and some fractality. This is one of the components, and the other one is this one. OK? So this is what you see. And now let's uh, see. The other question is, what can I say about uh, the maximum of the Fourier coefficients of the tangent, right? And it, it is, uh, there is another symmetry in this case, and it makes, uh, in fact, if T3, the, where this, uh, so I'm, I'm going to compute this, in fact, this, and these other ones. And I'm going to take the maximum. And in fact, the, by a very simple symmetry, when one is not zero, the other one is zero, and so on and so forth. Anyway, and this is the picture. So this is for the, the t1 plus i2, i t2. So this is the maximum. So I guess <coughs> you see, I was not expecting this to be this because <coughs> these these times are. I'm sorry, you are not missing the, the the. These are time. This is time, and this is the maximum. And of course, these peaks are the rationals. The smaller the denominator, the bigger the peak. Of course, well, this is, I guess if uh, there is a good definition of intermittency, I guess this is one, right? <coughs> and of course, you, that means that you, 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 you have transfer, definitely. I don't know how to prove this, and this is for the other one. OK, this is for the T3. And um, uh, you could wonder about uh, what happens here, right? 
And if you do a plug of a log, then it fits. But uh, poof, you have to do plenty of more experiments to see if there is really a log there or not. But we don't have any idea. At all. So as a conclusion, I do think that uh, in the right function space, the dynamics of uh, this uh, completely integrable system is much richer than what I would have expected at the beginning. And that's it. Thank you. But this is an effect of the um, of the periodic boundary conditions. Of course, this is the Talbot effect. So, but if you uh, if you uh, increase uh, the the length of the, uh, do you still observe these peaks, or do you have some dispersion coming? Well, uh, if you remain the, as long as you have periodic boundary conditions, it's going to happen. Of yes. course, the peaks the peaks will become smaller and smaller, but uh, I bet, yeah. It's a question of scale. But the stability uh, that the uh, result that you presented uses the dispersion a lot, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but you do it, I mean, the, uh, you see, we w the numerics of this is kind of uh, delicate because you really have to capture uh, uh, the, uh, the dynamics that happens at rational times, right? And then you could wonder, how are you going to be rational times in the computer? Well, here they are, right? These are the, the rational times, of course. But, um, and then, uh, well, we had uh, for quite some time, the Laoz of this is done with the Laoz, huh? We had plenty of uh, numerical simulations, but we were using the Schrodinger, uh, the stereographic projection. Thinking from an analytical point of view, the stereographic projection is better, right? Because then you don't have the nonlinearity at the biggest order. But it turns out that for the numerics it's extremely worse. Did that uh, this? In fact, we use in here. You are using very strongly that you don't. I mean, you have not just this equation, but also the other one. So in the numerics, you use first of all, you can use a spectral method. So from that point of view, the numerics, well, what you are saying, I would say, is very, very stable. It doesn't matter how long the period is, and it works pretty well. I mean, I, I don't understand why it works so well, but. Uh, but you really, well, uh, you have seen the pictures. I mean, you go to the rational times and you see your polygon of MQ sites. It is there. So I, I would say so, yeah. Because, uh, of course, the, the numerical scheme is, as I said, is spectral. Which is the reasonable thing to do here, of course. Yeah. Well, if not, let's... Uh, Thank Luis again. Yeah.